By the end of the last video, we had gotten to the idea that a density-independent ecology, the kind where population growth is not tuned to environmental limits, is what causes the species to be under persistent R selection, which leads to a suite of life history traits that we associate with the R strategists. Short lifespans, small adult body size, and large numbers of small offspring. But this presumes that the population sustains exponential growth through enough of its evolutionary history for our selection to shape the species as our strategists. Not all populations are going to do this, and in fact we might want to think that some will actually obey the directives given by a limiting environment, slowing, stopping, or even reversing population growth under conditions of increasing population density. This is what we mean by density dependence. The first thing to think about is how could this type of dynamic be realized for a real population and in real time. And remember that by basic density dependent dynamic, we mean that DNDT, the rate of change of population density or size, must be positive, meaning that the population is growing or increasing in size if the population is small. But if the population grows too large, DNDT will become negative. Negative growth of the population means that it's declining in size. What would make DNDT for a population become smaller and even negative if the population is too large or too dense? I ask this to students every semester, and every time I get the same three answers. Resource limitation is usually what comes up first. If the resources available are finite, for example, in a population of bunny rabbits, a farmer brings one wheelbarrow full of carrots every day. If there are just a few bunnies, this represents a sweet abundance of delicious food, and the bunnies reproduce like, well, rabbits. DNDT is positive. But then, if the number of bunnies is way greater than could be supported by a wheelbarrow per day of carrots, life would be kind of awful. The carrots would get eaten up and lots of sad, hungry bunnies would have to scrounge up food from other sources. The vegetation would be depleted, bunnies would starve, and fewer females would have enough resources to have babies at all. Mortality would outpace birth rates, or in other words, the population would decline. DNDT is less than zero. Then there's disease, and specifically transmissible disease. As if I didn't need to tell you, communicable disease needs contact to spread, and if the population is sparse, there's a sort of natural social distancing that takes place, and the mortality rate from infectious disease will be low. But put the bunnies into a densely populated bunny city and have the bunny youth crashing around in a bunny mosh pit and the contact rate will be very high and infection rates and mortality rates will go through the roof. I used to have to explain this to people, but I don't think that's even necessary anymore. Predation. Somebody always brings up predation. And I need to make it clear that predation may be density dependent, and it may also be density independent. In fact, density independent mortality due to predators might actually be more likely in the absence of specific conditions to set up the density dependence. For example, in my bunny population, if predation by coyotes represents a 4% risk of dying every day that a bunny rabbit comes outside to eat, you might say that in a sparse population of 100 bunnies, only four would die today. Whereas in a population of 10,000 bunnies, you'd have 400 dying. Now, more bunnies are getting eaten in the denser population, but this would still be an example of density independence because the rate of mortality is the same irrespective of bunny density. Yes, 400 is greater than four, but the rate of 4%, the per capita death rate, is the same, right? In order for predation to be density dependent, you'd have to have mortality rates increasing as a population becomes larger. For example, if a large kettle of hawks 
was concentrating its hunting efforts in areas where the prey is abundant, then you might have mortality from hawk predation being near zero when bunny density is low. But if there are a lot of bunnies in the area, the hawks would relentlessly hunt them from the skies and make lots of kills. Mortality would soar like, well, an eagle. This idea of predators adjusting their behavior to home in on prey when and where they're abundant is something that we'll be coming back to later in a couple of lectures. But can you see how the two dynamics I described are different? The constant 4% mortality by coyotes would be density independent, while the variable mortality rate by hawk predation would be density dependent. And since we're thinking here about density dependent sources of mortality, only the hawk type of predation would apply. The density independent predation by coyotes would not be an adequate example. Point here is that if someone ever were to ask you to name a density dependent factor negatively impacting population growth more as the population increases in size, predation without any qualification would not be a good answer you'd need to give a good explanation for why predation would be density dependent rather than density independent. Now, you could probably come up with other real-world factors that would result in this kind of density dependence, but irrespective of the actual cause, be it resource limitation or coronavirus or density-dependent predation or something else, we will account for density dependence in our population dynamic with the same mathematical construct. The thing that unites all forms of density dependence is that dndt is positive if n is small and negative if n is too big. Presumably, somewhere in between small and too big, there must be a value of n for which we would have dndt exactly equal to zero. We define this value as k, or the carrying capacity. If the population is smaller than the carrying capacity and less than k, then the population grows. dndt is greater than zero. If the population is larger than the carrying capacity and greater than k, then the population declines. dndt is less than zero. And if the population size is exactly equal to the carrying capacity, and equal to k. dndt is zero. There's zero growth and the population remains the same size. We account for density dependence in our population growth dynamic by starting with the same exponential growth function we used before. dndt is equal to nr. But now we're going to multiply by the logistic term k minus n over k. The population dynamic under density dependence is therefore dndt is equal to nr times k minus n over k. Let's check things out to confirm that the needed dynamics are achieved. If n is greater than k, then the numerator in the logistic term is negative, and so the sign of dndt must also be negative. n can never be negative and little r as well. If little r were negative, then that would mean that lambda is less than 1 and the population would be declining even before we put in any density dependent effects. So, n greater than k means for sure that dndt will be negative. If n is less than k, then the numerator is positive and dndt is also positive. And if n is equal to k, then the numerator becomes zero and the whole function, dndt, becomes zero as well. Boom. Oh, and one more thing. As n approaches zero, in other words, if n is really small compared with the carrying capacity, the logistic term approaches unity, and therefore the population dynamic approaches good old exponential growth. So if you were to start out with a very small population, you would see it growing more or less exponentially, while n is small enough that k minus n over k is still close enough to 1. So here's what you would have without density dependence. dndt is equal to nr, without worrying about the k minus n over k because it's close to 1. 
Then, as n becomes larger, the density-dependent effects ramp up, and k minus n over k becomes a smaller and smaller fraction of 1, though still positive, and the population grows much more slowly than what you would expect under exponential growth. As n starts to approach the carrying capacity, k minus n over k approaches 0, as does dn dt. There's an asymptotic approach to the equilibrium where n is equal to k. The population is at its carrying capacity. If you started out with a population size greater than the carrying capacity, you get the same type of asymptotic approach only from above rather than from below. k minus n over k is called the logistic term. And this formulation of density-dependent population dynamics is sometimes referred to as logistic growth, giving you a sort of S-shaped curve rather than the J-shape of exponential growth. It's an old-school mathematical construct put together in the early 1900s as a demonstration of how equations can work to model nature and allow for analytical approaches that weren't really conceived of before. The birds and the flowers were things that you appreciated by observation and description only, and this was, at the time, a brand new way of studying nature. Pretty soon, you had people running experiments with model systems in the laboratory to see if the basic dynamics predicted by math were actually realized by organisms under the controlled conditions of laboratory experimentation. And the answer was basically yes. but. Often, the approach to n equal k was not so much asymptotic as it was oscillatory. The increasing population overshot the carrying capacity and ended up having to decline, and then it overshot the carrying capacity on the way down, ending up below n is equal to k. This is actually pretty easy to understand if you think about how there might be a lag time to respond to the actual conditions experienced by a population of a given density. Take humans, for example. If we had been on the increase and were at carrying capacity right now, today, we would still be increasing because the births happening right now, today, are actually a reflection of conditions that were in play nine months ago. So, Nine months' worth of buns in the oven are still going to be coming into the world at a rate dictated by values that were lower than k. And yeah, nine months from now, the human population would actually achieve zero growth. But by then, we'll be above our carrying capacity and we'll have to decline. Then, on the way down, we'll overshoot the carrying capacity again because when we hit n is equal to k, the growth rate will reflect conditions from nine months previous when the population was above k. The amount of overshoot may be less than the first, and the next will be smaller still, and so we end up approaching n is equal to k, but with dampening oscillations rather than the asymptotic approach. A neat dynamic here is that as you increase the lag time, these oscillations would grow in both period and in amplitude. At some point, you could theoretically get to stable oscillations, and at even longer lags, you'd have unstable oscillations in which a population would ultimately crash. And maybe this is another way of thinking about boom and bust species. It's not that they totally lack an ability to respond to signals from the environment, but rather that they're too slow. Their long lag times means that they will way overshoot the carrying capacity and then crash down to near nothing. This doesn't change anything from our earlier discussion. They're still subject to selection under conditions of exponential growth through most of their histories. This is just another way of thinking about them as a sort of extreme variation of what we're looking at in our current model, you know, rather than something qualitatively different. Another reason I bring this up is that in the textbook, you will have seen diagrams showing both asymptotic and oscillatory approaches to n is equal to k, but without giving much explanation for the oscillations. I thought I'd just fill in that gap because a, it's nothing too hard for a Bio 202 student to understand, and b, it's really kind of fun to think about.
Now, what are some examples of species with ecologies that are strongly density dependent? These would be ones where the population stays at or very close to a constant size over years and years. Well, not humans. We have been on a population boom since around the time of the New Testament, and this got even stronger starting with the Industrial Revolution. In this regard, we're a particularly bad example. But other primates are much better examples. When they built the Panama Canal, they dammed up the Chagres River, creating a lake, Lake Gatun, that forms part of the passageway for the ships. Barro, Colorado Island, or BCI, is in the middle of Lake Gatun. 15 square kilometers of virgin forest and isolated by water from the rest of Panama. BCI is a mecca for people studying tropical biology. They basically have every tree, shrub, and liana mapped out. Just about every bug on the island has been captured and described. And this is probably the most exhaustively studied tract of tropical forest in the world. Among everything else, they also keep tabs on the spider monkeys and howler monkeys and all the other species of monkeys on the island, which all remain pretty isolated populations because monkeys are notorious avoiders of swimming. And yeah, my point here is that if you look at these monkey populations on BCI, they tend to remain pretty stable over time. Pretty close to what you would expect for a population that's holding at n is equal to k because of density-dependent factors controlling their population growth. The trees on BCI are also pretty much at stable density, but not all tree species, just the ones that are considered climax species. In the event of any kind of habitat disturbance, there's a predictable pattern of succession that occurs. For example, if you were to clear all the plants from a given area of forest, let's say you bought a hectare of forested land in Idaho, and cut down all of the trees and turn them into toilet paper. That land would be invaded by weedy species, good colonizers. Shorter weeds would then get shaded out by taller weeds, and weedy kinds of trees would come in and shade out the tallest non-tree weeds. An example of a weedy tree, a great colonizer, in western forests is the aspen tree. They grow quickly and will rapidly come to dominate an area of forest. But eventually, the aspens will be outcompeted by Douglas fir and spruce trees, which grow slower and are more shade tolerant than the aspens. In the mature or climax forest, after succession is completed, you'd have the firs and the spruces remaining at equilibrium density, n is equal to k, for long periods of time, continually for generations even. So density dependence, it's a thing. And what are the characteristics that make species like monkeys and climax forest trees successful? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's not our selected traits like short lifespan or large numbers of small babies. In fact, it's quite the opposite. In order to succeed, you must be able to thrive under harsh conditions, shade and intense competition in the case of spruce trees, or limiting resources and density-dependent eagle predation in the case of monkeys. How does life under such harsh conditions shape our life history characteristics? Well, the short view is that it's just the polar opposite of what we expect for our strategists longer lifespans, larger adult body size, fewer and larger offspring. But we still need to play out the logical sequence by which these life history traits are actively selected, rather than just saying that in the absence of our selection, you won't have the R strategist traits. Let's start with offspring size, because that's the easiest. Remember that conditions are harsh, and that means that there's a struggle to survive. And the most vulnerable age class is always the newborns, the young of the year.
Survival, or quality of young, not quantity, becomes the driver of evolution. How do you gain an edge in fitness relative to the rest of your kind? Well, have it so that your babies make it reliably through that very dicey first year of life. And how do you do that? Make your babies bigger. This may be the first, best, and only thing you do. And just as you can't make as many jumbo-sized cookies from a batch of dough, making larger babies means that you'll have to deal with a lower fecundity, a lower birth rate. Just as before. We're not saying that selection is favoring lower birth rate. That's not true at all. Rather, selection is so strongly favoring offspring survival, and thus larger offspring size, that some fitness loss in the form of lower fecundity is the collateral damage under this set of conditions. Now let's move on to adult body size. In the absence of exponential growth conditions, there's no real advantage for reproducing earlier. But your survival under harsh, highly competitive conditions at n equal to k means that you need to allocate more heavily on the side of maintenance and survival, and this means less allocation put towards reproduction. But if you need to make big babies, this means that you still need to have a pretty sizable investment into reproduction, right? It should seem to you that allocating resources towards survival could interfere with your ability to produce large, high-quality offspring. Well, one way around this dilemma is to start out with a larger set of available resources, enough to allow you to swing plenty towards reproduction and also still have a lot left for your own survival. And the obvious way to do this would be to have a larger body. If a developmental mutation delays your sexual maturity and you end up in pre-reproductive growth mode for some number of years past the norm, you will end up as a larger adult with a larger resource base, better capable of making larger babies that are better at surviving, while still having plenty left over for your own survival. Sounds like a solid plan, right? Sure, you don't get the advantages of having shorter generation time, but that's not the driving factor here as it was for density independent ecologies where population growth is usually following exponential increase. Here, we're evolving under ecological conditions with mostly zero growth. And so while selection might actually favor to some degree early reproduction, other things being equal, other things are far from equal. And earlier reproduction is in total conflict with stronger selection on other traits, like the benefit taken from having larger adult body size. We don't need to develop the longevity issue here We've already said that we're going to allocate more towards survival relative to reproduction, and this will also have the effect of increasing life expectancy. Longer lifespan is just another trait expected to evolve under strong density-dependent conditions. Now, one more life history trait that's very pertinent here is parental care. This obviously and directly relates to increasing the survival rate of offspring. Sticking around and feeding and protecting your babies has basically the same effect as making your offspring larger. And so parental care is something we might expect to evolve as adaptive to density dependent ecologies. Now, in order to be a successful parent, it's essential to survive reproduction. And so even though we've already said that density dependence will favor allocation towards survival over reproduction, with parental care added to the mix, you would expect an even stronger nod toward maintenance and survival rather than reproduction, and this would just reinforce the patterns that we've already talked about, leading to larger body size and longer lifespan. In the last video, we talked about our selection and our strategists. The suite of opposite traits evolving under strong density dependent ecologies are referred to as K strategist characteristics evolving under K selection. Besides monkeys and spruce trees, can you think of a few other species that bear life history traits consistent with K selection?
With only a small number of lectures to talk about ecology, I felt that this topic, density independence and R selection, density dependence and case selection, is one that carries a lot of impact. First, it demonstrates how an organism's ecology serves as an important driving force in its evolution. And we're talking about life history traits that really define the organism. Would a sardine really be a sardine if it had not been selected under conditions leading to its small body size? Second, it gives us a nice black versus white dichotomy for living things. Just as you can now look at a flowering plant and ponder monocot or not a monocot. Now you can look at, well, take an elephant, the one that was in the room earlier, and ponder are selected or K-selected. It's not that all organisms are necessarily going to be one or the other, but you can use this dichotomy as a starting point for thinking about the mitigating factors, ecological or other constraining factors that could draw species away from being strictly one or the other. Or when there seems to be a disconnect between the growth pattern of a species and the life history traits that it displays. Humans are a particularly good example here. Long lives, large bodies, large babies usually born as single births, huge, and I mean huge, investments of parental care. Clearly, we fall into the case selected area. This may seem inconsistent with our population growth trajectory, which really resembles that of lemmings far more than the steady population size of, say, spider monkeys on Barrow, Colorado Island. What's going on with us? I'm not even going to answer that here. You give me the explanation. And then you've got the extremist life histories. Take a Chinook salmon, for example. It's a big fish living in the sea for most of its life. Now, big marine fishes will usually take a relatively standard, somewhat conservative approach to reproduction, investing sizably, but not too hugely and keeping plenty for their own survival, but using what they do allocate to make lots and lots of little eggs. That's standard uh, for large marine fishes like cod or tuna. They typically do this year after year in a reproductive strategy called iteroparity, like our iterated prisoner's dilemma from earlier in the semester. Parity or reproduction happens over and over again. Salmon take a different route. They don't reproduce at all through many years of growth at sea, and when they finally reach sexual maturity, they basically use all of the resources to make an enormous investment. They make a huge number of really large eggs, and they expend great amounts of energy migrating far up into freshwater rivers and streams to deposit their eggs. In effect, the large egg size and freshwater habitat combine to make a surrogate for parental care. You don't require the parents to actually be there to personally protect the young, which is a good thing, because as a consequence of this enormous investment, the adult salmon die. No salmon survives for a second round of reproduction. It's procreation in one gigantic blast, followed by death. This reproductive strategy is called semel parity, after the Greek myth of Semele, a mortal female who had one sexual tryst with Zeus, the boss of all gods and was burnt to a crisp in this brief moment of glorious reproduction. Look up the story if you want the details, like what happened to her baby if she was incinerated by the father of her love child. Pacific salmon are semelparis. Can you think of other species that are also semelparis? Now, in regard to parental care, salmon and other semel para species aside, it makes sense to exercise restraint in allocating toward offspring number because you need to survive childbirth in order to offer parental care to your offspring. But if postpartum parental care requires high touch, 
you probably want to cut back even further because there's probably a limit to the number of offspring that you can adequately provide parental care for. This brings up another classic piece of ecological research from the mid-1900s done by David Lack, who studied clutch size in birds. A female bird really can lay one egg per day, tops. But it would be highly problematic if the first egg laid also had a head start in development. You want all the eggs to hatch on the same day or two. And we get that because development doesn't start until incubation begins. The mama bird can lay her eggs one per day in the nest, but she won't start to sit on them until she's laid the last egg in the clutch. The number of eggs she lays before starting the incubation is called the clutch size, and it doesn't reflect the maximum number of eggs that the female could lay. If you were to do kind of a mean thing and remove the mama bird's eggs while she's in her days of laying, she'll actually keep on laying eggs well past her natural clutch number. If you were to sneak in an extra egg, she would stop laying her own eggs and start incubating one day earlier. Brood parasites like cuckoos and cowbirds do exactly this, getting the host birds to raise a chick that's not even theirs. By the way, we totally take advantage of this aspect of bird behavior in order to get chickens to lay sometimes hundreds of eggs per year. Just keep taking them away. If you ever allow the eggs to accumulate, this can induce your chickens to get broody, and they'll just sit and do nothing and be in a pissy mood the whole time. Even if you take the eggs away, the hen will just sit wherever she is. You can move her anywhere and she'll just sit there. It's weird. So David Lack conducted all kinds of studies on clutch size. We'll talk about only the one variable that's relevant to our current discussion. For any given bird species, like the American Robin, Turtus migratorius, remember? There's a clutch size that's characteristic for the species, but there's also a range of variation. For example, in robins, most females will stop between three and five eggs with a mean of something like 4.1, 4.2. You might have a few females laying two or even one, and a few females laying six or seven. The distribution of clutch sizes, which is our phenotype here, follows roughly a normal distribution. The mean clutch size, 4.1, 4.2, it remains the same over decades, suggesting that stabilizing selection is what keeps the mean clutch size for Turtus migratorius at the steady 4.1. This means that birds laying the median number of eggs have the highest expected fitness, while birds laying fewer or more eggs than the median would have a lower expected fitness. Now, it makes sense that the very smallest clutches laying fewer eggs than the median would result in lower fitness. A bird's fitness is closely tied to the number of babies it's able to fledge, that is, rear to the point of independence. If you lay only two eggs when you have the resources to fledge more babies than just two, then your fitness would be lower than a bird that lays more eggs and is able to fledge more offspring. But why should fitness drop if you lay above the median number? Shouldn't fitness just increase with larger and larger clutch size? I hope you can see the answer here without any further explanation from me. But here's my explanation anyways. Yeah, it's all about limits to the number of babies that a pair of adult robins can properly care for. You're okay with four babies. Pushing it with five. With six, you know you're in over your head. And if you were foolish enough to start with seven babies, you end up just throwing your wings in the air and flying off to Cancun, leaving the seven babies to fend for themselves, but most likely they'll just get eaten by a predator, a raven or something like that. You can't raise seven babies. What were you thinking, bird? Of course, your fitness is gonna be terrible. 
Robins are pretty common birds around here. I see them all the time. Another bird that's just as common and about the same size as a robin is the California quail, Calipepla californica. I see them early in the morning or late in the evening. And in the spring and early summer, I'll often see a mama quail followed by a bunch of her babies. By comparison with robins, clutch size for quail is huge, something like 12. So why the difference? Size of the eggs? Size of the birds? No, they're about the same. The difference is that robins have altricial young, while the young of quail are precocial. Altricial young are born helpless, and like robin chicks in the nest, they demand food to be delivered to them from the mouths of their parents. Precocial young are much more self-sufficient. Think of how just hatched chicks of chickens start drinking water and pecking at food within an hour of their hatching. They're just like a precocious child, freakishly skilled beyond what's expected of one at such a tender age. And, okay, I hope you can see that this lesson is pretty straightforward. The precocial nature of the young of quail relaxes the selection against larger clutches that we understood to be true for the robins because their young are altricial. Whatever aspect of stabilizing selection sets the upper limit for clutch size in quail, it's not going to be tied to the ability of quail parents to regurgitate worms into the mouth of quail babies. It might have a different cause. Maybe the size of the mama bird's butt, which limits the number of eggs that she can incubate. Now, if somehow robins were able to switch from altricial young to precocial young, how would this change the trajectory of their clutch size evolution? Well, increase it, right? Now, something like this actually happens. Maybe not so much with robins, but in other migrating birds, like the ones that make it way up into the high latitudes to breed, they have a somewhat relaxed burden of parental care, even without the precocial young, because of the high densities of flying insects there during the summer months. I guess baby chicks can just open their mouths and let the bugs fly in, and this lets the clutch size be considerably larger than what would be possible with altricial young at temperate latitudes like where the robins live. By the way, it's almost certainly true that precocial young was the ancestral state for all birds. All of the basal clades of birds, the paleognaths like ostriches and rheas, the gallo and cerids like chickens and ducks, they have precocial young. Presumably this is also true for the Mesozoic non-avian dinosaurs. What this means is that at some point, Selection drove the evolution of altricial young and intensive high-touch parental care in most of the rest of the birds. And this would be suggestive of density dependence or density independence. We'll be shifting gears next and talking about interactions between populations of different species. I usually start the introduction to this in this lecture, but I think I'll hold off on those details until the next video. Bye!